I don't know if I understood right. Yeah, you referenced something to Shias, and, and the date was like 692 or 695 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard, Shia was really started during Safavi. Is it, did it exist at that 680, time? 680, what has happened in 680 CA? Why do I need Hussein, it's Karbala. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, she is that has already, I mean, these events resonate and has made, you know, real impact uh, in, in the Middle East, in Iraq. I mean, in Kufa, uh, you know, and Iran, it's already, you have factions who are pro alit uh, you know, the, the faction of Ali. Now, what we call as sort of church Shiism, or, you know, what we call as institutional Shiism, the Safavids make it current in Iran as the official state religion, yeah. but certainly there are Shiite elements and family ruling dynasties in, yeah, in they Iran were already in the 18th century. Named century. Shia? Well, we call them Shia. They're, they're you know, the various type of uh, Shias. Uh, all the way up north in Caspian, Zaydis. Zaydis are up there as it is the Ziyarids. They're up there operating in Yemen and in the Caspian. Uh, by the Caspian Sea. You have certainly Shias in uh, Iraq, that is their center of power. Ali and, you know, why is it the battle taking place in Kabul? Because Ali and, uh, uh, you know, Hussein, um, that is their uh, power base, as opposed to the Omayyads who are in Syria. And what I'm saying is interesting that these local Iranians are making alliances with the Omayyads there, yeah. right? They're not doing so. Something else of interest, yeah, that, that I should stay. <laughs> Uh, please, and then please. Yes, I know. I'm aware that you may be asking a very um, uneducated question no, in your view. But so. uh, nevertheless, um, taking modern theories of the formation of the cultural self and cultural, postmodern theories of cultural theories, things like that, what was the interaction between, let's say, the local Iranian? mentality, and if there is even a possibility to say that there was such a thing, check on all the diversities of different channels, and, and the incoming Arabic influence, because, I mean, I see these are like two very different cult ethos, uh, types of ethos. One is nomadic and conquering, and the other one is sedimented. And then, um, and then the question which is coming second to that will be, um, is there a possibility that the Iranian influence uh, can be counted in the history of Islam itself and separation of Sunnah and uh, Shia trends? Let me answer the second question. That was, in, that was the traditional explanation in the 19th and perhaps early 20th uh -huh. century. Shia is Iranian and Sunni is non-Iranian. But that's really Iranian not... Iranian in what sense? It's not. It's not. I'm saying that's not really the case. This is the post-South habit that we get that sort of a viewpoint. Iranians were dominantly Sunni until the coming of, at least if we don't have rough, you know, exact numbers, but uh, were dominantly Sunni uh, until the South habit period. It's on the South habit period that we get this change. Uh, your first question in terms of the uh, interaction, well, what I try to show is that you have the leaders of these cities, uh, you know, either priests or generals or the mass want, deal in one way with the conquerors. Submit, pay, you know, jizya, convert, or fight and die and get. You know, that's the three type of general encounters that you get with them. Now, uh, go ahead, you want, did I answer your question? Um, is there such a thing as quality self, as a configuration, as a psychological configuration? Oh in comparison and can it be compared in general with the self which is coming in with the Arabic conquest? And if you completely dismiss this question, I will be No, no, I it. won't. I, I think it depends what sources you look. If you look at Zoroastrian sources in Middle Persia, there's certainly this idea of self and the other. That dichotomy is clear. It's just really sort of the boundary is clear. Now, does that mean that's exactly what played out? You can never tell. We're making assumptions, you know, we need hard evidence. And one text here saying one thing and one text saying that doesn't really tell us anything. It's not that clear. Okay. Uh, sorry, sir, and then I'll, I have to go here. Yes? Uh, I was going to say, what do you think the Safavids did? I mean, why did they choose to go 
I'm not a Safa bid expert. I leave that to the Safa bid expert. Uh, but I think in the 13th, 14th century, you have a rise of militant Sufism uh, from North Africa all the way to the Iranian plateau. And what you're getting is you get the militancy of Sufi orders, where the Safavids, I think, has uh, also attached itself to it. Uh, we made it one of the dominant groups in there. But that's all I'm going to say uh, because I shouldn't really say more than anything. Please, please. Yes. Well, um, I have two questions. One is that, um, do we have any literature on what the people, the common people, or the commoners are feeling or talking about at the time of the conquest? Uh, no, because... Who are they signing with, if at all? No, no. What we're getting are texts from the Muslims, these Futu literature that said, we came and conquered. Then you have Zoroastrian texts written a bit after the conquest. That these people have come from hell, they look horrible, they want to, you know, they bury their dead, they eat their dead, they, you know, they kill people. The worst thing that has ever happened to Iran Shah, you know, in its history, it probably it's the end of the world, he is the savior come and just put an end to this misery. Okay? So you get a religious view of a group that was probably the dominant group of these new conquerors who are now the masters. And then you have the conquerors who are saying, oh, look, the few people we came and killed them. Now, the common people, we don't know. I mean, if unless there was our answer, if there was our answer, we would you know, suggest that that is what their viewpoint is. Uh, but we really don't know what the common person here did or felt. I gave a talk at UCLA, I think, last month, and there was this issue of, uh, I talked about Iran Shah, this idea of Iran, and an identity that I think comes about with the Sasanians and goes all the way through the, until the 12th century. It's really there. They said, what about the common person? Well, you know, when we look at, you know, we were talking about Roman history and so on, as my colleague said, we look at the elite. That's, these are the people who leave us writing. Okay, it's not the common view. Now, of course, we do have letters of uh, mostly economic transactions, and I think the largest group is now at Berkeley in the Bancroft Library. Uh, how many are they? I forgot about 240? Oh, close to 300. 300 documents, these were letters sealed and signed that have come to light that Berkeley has it uh, from about uh, late Sasanian to early Islam, right, six to 800? That tells you, oh please, more right, go buy some oil, you know, get this jug of oil and give it to so-and-so, I'm worried about you, write back to me, what's going on? So also this idea of a Doran Sukhu, two centuries of silence that Iranians didn't write, is completely false. We have uh, Pahlavi documents, all the way to the 8th century. Also, they're selling wine and exchanging wine. So we know Islamic law does, did not apply in the 7th century to the Iranians, at least from this place, which seems to have been, according to Jinyu Surah Nawad, that is Qom, what is modern-day Qom, where there were all these wineries that people were selling wine. <laughs> it didn't actually apply there in the 7th and 8th century. So then Muslims didn't come into us and say, okay, no drinking. That is not what it seems to have happened. Okay. Please. Somebody had a question here? Please, sir. And we'll go back in. Yes, if I may. In regard to uh, Shiism and uh, Sunnism, I heard a version of this having to do with the fact that Iranians couldn't just subscribe to a caliph being the ruler because they highly valued this blood linkage as far as the kings were concerned. So they went ahead and said, okay, the prophet Ali was his first cousin, his blood was in his veins, and so on and so forth with his children. And that's why the Shiism really had its foundation early on. Because even though you said most of the Iranians were so inspired to the Safavid dynasty. So I don't know if that's... That's a nice version that we also in Iran have uh, grown up with as a tradition. Uh, but if we look at, I think, early sources, there's nothing there that tells us that the Iranians in mass or in general have that type of uh, you know, interest in this uh, sense. Okay, sir. Yeah, question about the coins. I mean, I find it kind of creepy what I saw from the, the coins you showed. Uh, most of them were just only either in the Arab script or in the Pahlavi script. I mean, have you seen a mix of those things? No. What you get uh, Arab names written in Pahlavi. The intermediate period is there. So before Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, you know, Obaidullah, I forgot his last name before Hassan, his name is in Pahlavi. A lot of these people are writing as Arabic names in Pahlavi. So any coin is. Either fully in Arabic or fully in 
That's right, there's nothing in between. Sir? Question about the, the famous story about the wife of the Imam Hussein is considered the, a princess of Iran, the daughter of the Yazgir. Is it true or is it just? Uh, well, uh, Allah <laughs> 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 Is there a document like that or something? I should say it again, Allah <laughs> Alam, but uh, yeah. I should also say that uh, about five years ago, no, about ten years ago, the, the most interesting manuscript was found, I think, in uh, Astana Qutsar Azadi, a text called Ali Name. This is a Shiite epic about Ali and his family, written in Persian about 20 to 40 years after the Shahnameh, which in fact is a dialogue of a sort of uh, interacting with the Shahnameh. You know, at the end saying that, look, this Shahnameh thing is just story and fables of these people. If you really want real stories, you have to come to the epic of Ali which has this tradition. So the earliest one is at least 40 years in Persian after the Shahnameh. So it's 11th century. That has just been published. I've seen the manuscript being published. And I think there's a work to have uh, you know, uh, the edited volume, which has all sorts of interesting Irano-Shiite tradition, including that one, which became a popular story in where everyone was saying, well, this is a later tradition and you know, written about. Mary Boyce, I think, has written something about Bibi Shahbon when these I ideas uh, as well, but we now even see it all the way in the 11th century uh, as a textual Persian tradition as well. But again, as I would say, I'm not allowed. I am not Sir, I'm sorry. Uh, can you touch just a little bit on you know the modern nationalist paradigm and look at these conflicts as something as you know Iranian culture, Arab culture, you know, have been historically coming into contact and fighting, and you know, it was in this geographic context. But at the time of these conquests, was that kind of ideology existing among the people where, you know, it was the defense of everything that is Iranian versus, you know, this, this scary Arab culture? Or was it just a question of warfare, geographic, you yeah. know? It depends on what source and what period you're looking for. Zoroastrian texts are really clear about this. Arabs are bad because they've come and conquered. They've taken what belongs here. They're Iranian values that they have, they are defining, okay? So that is clear in terms of what you see in, you know, 8th, 9th, 10th century Zoroastrian Middle Persian texts. You can't get away from it. Okay? Uh, so there's that. Now, Arabs and Iranians being in contact, they have been in contact much longer than that. Much, much longer than that. Sasanians, in fact, the first people to uh, settle Arab tribes uh, in the Iranian plateau are not uh, after the conquest, but during the Sasanian period. If you just simply pick up Tabari, it says during the time of Shahpur II, when he goes on a rampage and destroys, you know, the, the south of the Persian Gulf, and you know, kills a lot of uh, the Arabs who take when he takes the title, he's given the title of Dolaktaf, right, the piercer of shoulder. What is he saying? He's killed a lot of Arabs, and then the, the typical Near Eastern idea of displacing tribes and people in Kerman, uh, further up north and in Fars, wholesale Arab tribes are settled. Down. So the Arabs are in, in Iran. It's not that there is this, you know, complete demarcation. Now, what happens is there were walls uh, built uh, on the sides of the Sasanian Empire uh, to keep nomadic forces coming in, be it Arab nomads, be it you know nomadic forces in the northeast, or the ones coming from the Caucasus. Uh, so it's not Arab, but it's about I think people who are nomads and how to deal with nomads. Either you settle them or you fight them, sir. 